Uh, thank you for uh, parking as it was requested. Uh, for those of you that may have wondered what we were talking about, the parking lot is being repaved. Um, very thankful for that. God's blessed and we're able to get it done. Um, they've begun the process and they, uh, they started laying pavement across the street today. Um, the schedule, according to what Maureen said they told her, is they should finish across the street tomorrow and begin on this side of the street. And then hopefully this side will be completely finished Friday afternoon, which is good because we need a little bit of time for it to cure before we park on it. So um, hopefully everything will be ready for Sunday morning for us to be able to park. But um, we're very thankful that they're getting all of that done. It's going to be really nice. And uh, so be careful. As you've noticed, coming down the sidewalk, they moved all the parking pylons so they could pave over there. So please be careful walking down the sidewalk. Uh, it's lit out on the uh, sidewalk tonight, much, much needed, and the lights are working. We still have a few that haven't been repaired yet. They're still working on those. So um, very wonderful news. Things are looking good, and uh, so we're thankful for that. Um, Ms. Vicky's not able to be with us tonight. Uh, so we won't be having, and Miss Sharon, both y'all be in prayer for Miss Sharon. She's uh, feeling, un she's sick, not feeling well. So please keep her in prayer. Uh, Miss Vicky just had some things that was preventing her from being here, but um, y'all be in prayer for Miss Sharon for sure. All right. So again, I am glad to see you. And since we uh, won't be having any um, music and singing tonight, unless if somebody want to play the piano and. No, no, no volunteers. So since we won't be having any uh, music portion tonight, we're going to open in a word of prayer and we're going to jump right on into chapter three of the book of Nehemiah. All right. So let's pray. Father, we do come to you tonight. Thank you so much for all the blessings that you give. Father, we're so thankful that we're able to uh, get out of bed, Father, to uh, make it to church, to worship together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, Father, to spend this time together with you, Father, to study your word. Father, what a blessing it is when we, when we dig into your word. God, I remember when I, I, I took a, a seminary class, Father, that talked about how to study the Bible, and I thought I already knew. But, Father, I found out that there's so many ways to study it, and you learn something out of every different way that you do it. Father, what a blessing to know that uh, we could probably study this book for our entire life and never know it all. But one day, Father, when we step into glory, it'll all be revealed. Father, we're so thankful for that. Tonight, as we open your word, Father, we pray that you would reveal to us what you want us to know. And Father, we thank you for all of these things. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. So again, we are in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 3. Nehemiah chapter 3. Now, just a quick recap. Uh, we know Nehemiah was, uh, uh, had, had a vision he had been given, and he began to pray, and he spent um, uh, a long time praying and seeking God of what God would have him to do. And then once he uh, realized what it was that God would have him to do, he went before the king, and the king uh, said, why do you look sad? And he said, well, how can I not be sad when this is going on in Jerusalem? And so he got commission from the king, permission and commission from the king to go uh, to Jerusalem and help to rebuild the walls and have everything back as it needed to be. Uh, the people in Jerusalem had rebuilt the temple, yet they had not completed the process by building the walls and making everything as it should be. And so um, this was something that needed to be done. And they already were in a place where uh, those that were around them were kind of dictating and stopping them from doing the work that they needed to do. And uh, so Nehemiah got uh, the information, the letters from the king that said he was to rebuild the walls and they weren't to stop him. So all good news. Now, he got back to um, Jerusalem and when he shared with them, uh, the people, all the things that uh, he wanted them to see and see the distress we're in, he said, and all of those things. The people uh, tore their clothes and they began to realize that um, there were things that needed to happen. And so when all of this happened, they were, were 
felt that they were up to the challenge. What are they going to do? And the people outside the walls were saying, are you going to rebel? Are you going to do this against the king? They had no idea that um, the king had commissioned it. Uh, but Nehemiah didn't even tell them that. He just said, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. So yes, we're going to get this done. They laughed at them. They, they um, thought it was hilarious that they were going to rebuild these gates and the walls. Yet they said, yes, we're, we're still going to do that. So tonight we're going to um, be talking about a lot of different people. Um, there's more than 50 names that are in this passage of Nehemiah. So I can, that means I have at least 50 opportunities to mess up the names. Um, and I'm sure I will probably mess up about 45 of them at least. So uh, bear with me on all that as we go through these passages. But we're going to start in verse 1 and 2 of Nehemiah. So in verse 1 and 2, chapter 3, it says, Then Elisha, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. They built as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it, then as far as the Tower of Hananel. Next to Elisha, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zachor, the son of Emery, built. So, right away we see a few things. We see the first of all, the first person that's mentioned in all of this when they begin to rebuild everything is the high priest. The high priest jumped up and immediately began to build. That's an incredible thing to think about, that it, it wasn't, he wasn't the one that was sitting back directing the work. He wasn't the one that was... Um, standing over here praying about it while everybody else was working, he jumped right in there and began to work right away. That's important because when we see that, we see a, an example that's set, right? Um, so uh, a previous pastor of this church I met uh, several, several years ago, um, um, and uh, Brother Everett. And I was talking to Brother Everett, Brother Gene and myself actually were talking to Brother Everett and we were talking about things that we had done and some cleanup day and all of that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, I had been up here and doing all those things and Brother Everett said, well, here's the thing you need to know. He said, if you want to be a shepherd, you got to smell like the sheep. Um, there's a lot to that. You understand that if you're going to be a shepherd, you don't just walk around and, and tell the sheep what to do. You're all in amongst them. You're doing the things that they're doing. And in this passage, we see the high priest, he let the people see that he was immediately the first one that jumped up and started to build to set the example for the people to follow, for them to see that the high priest was willing to get his hands dirty and jump in and do all of this. That meant a lot. It was a motivator. They built, everything about this is people, they built, they worked together, and they built, they start out with the sheep gate. Well, the sheep gate was important. The sheep gate was uh, one of the critical entry points of the city, and it was named the sheep gate because it was where the shepherds brought their sheep to sell. That's where the shepherds brought their sheep down to sell, and they brought them um, to that gate. And so this was a very important thing. Uh, by the way, the sheep gate up until just a few years ago, it was still being used for that same purpose in Jerusalem. They were still bringing the sheep down to the sheep gate to sell in Jerusalem. So even up until just a few years ago, that was still happening. So the sheep gate was being rebuilt. That was the first thing that uh, the high priest, Elisha, uh, did. And he was the first worker. He rose up to do the work. Now, when we look at all of this and we see that not only did he rebuild the sheep gate, but he also began working on the section of the wall near the sheep gate. So the first thing that they had that they rebuilt were the gates. They started working on the gates. Why did they start working on the gates first? Because those were the points of entry. Those were the critical points of entry. So any enemy that might want to attack them, the gates were important for those to be repaired. Most of the walls were in some shape form or fashion still there but the gates had been completely burned and destroyed and so they needed to rebuild the gates and get them in place first but as they started with the gates then they went out from the gates onto the walls and they began to rebuild into the walls now it's important for you to understand and remember you probably have heard this before but the walls that surrounded the city of, of Jerusalem the walls that were all the way around 
those walls were not just walls like we think about a wall. Those walls were like they were wide enough that there were homes built into the walls. Okay, so some people actually lived in the walls of the city. And so there were homes that were actually built into the walls in addition to the walls and the gates and all of that that was there. So some of those are still okay. They're still intact, but some of the walls are, da are down. The gates are destroyed, and that's where they begin. They started with the sheep gate. It was one of the most important gates that they had. Um, he, the high priest was the first worker, and he got up and acted just like a leader should, and because of that, people began to follow him. Now, it says that he, they built the sheep gate, and then they consecrated it. They consecrated it. So what was so important about the fact that once they built the gate, they consecrated it? Well, here's the important thing. The idea behind the consecration is that it makes it special and unique. It makes it important to God. It's, it's for God's service. Okay? So um, one of the things when it talks about, um, when you read in, in the Old Testament, it talks about um, Joshua and they were getting ready to cross over into the promised land, and he told him to consecrate the people before they went across into the promised land. And so what that meant was that those people were dedicating themselves to God's glory and to his work before they crossed into the promised land. When they rebuilt the sheep gate, once it was rebuilt, they consecrated it, and basically they're saying we built this gate for the purpose of God's glory and his service. So we've built this gate, we've consecrated it, we've offered it up to God, and we know by giving it up to God that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. It's going to stand. It's something that we're building for him. They weren't building it so that all the neighbors could go, ooh, ah, oh, look at that gate, how they did a, such a good job. They were building the gate because they knew it was directed by God for them to rebuild the walls, and they consecrated it to him, saying, God, this is for your glory and your service. So it was important that they consecrated that as they began the building process. They wanted everything to be set apart as they did that. It was the first work, the first thing that was done, and so it was set apart. You know, that's the whole thing for us is when we, we think about our walk and our life and the things that we do in life, what do we do them for? Who do we do them for? All the things that we do, when we get prepared to start a project or something that we need to do, something we're having a desire about, what do, what do we do? Do we think about even what we're doing? It, who are we doing it for? Is there a purpose in what we're doing or is it simply just because? Well, the reality is if all of us would consider the things that we do as being something that we uh, consecrate and that we give it to God and it's for him and for his glory, how much difference would that make in everything you do? When I was youth minister, I, I had our, our youth group, we adopted uh, Colossians 3.23. Now, Colossians 3.23 and Colossians 3.17 are very close to one another. And Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In whatever you do. And, and uh, 3.23 says, And everything you do, do it as for God and not for man. Do it for God. Everything you do, do it for God. No matter what it is, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him. Do it for God. Everything you do. Now think about that. Do we, is everything we do, do we do it for God? Well, no. We don't. If we're honest, we don't. We do plenty of things we do just for, just for us. We don't do it for God, but that's not how we should be doing things. We should be doing it for God. I had a co-worker that I worked with uh, during that time frame, and she was having a really hard time because uh, there was a boss that was giving us a really hard time and doing a lot of things, and she said there's some days she just really wanted to get ugly about it and I happened to give her one of my cards had Colossians 3:23 on the back of it and she put it right on the front of her desk and every time she started to get mad about something she said that wouldn't be for God <laughs> if I did that I wouldn't be doing it for God and everything I do so I need to do it for God so instead she would say good morning she would say good afternoon she would be nice even when she wanted to be angry it helped her to think about it how would this be pleasing to God if I reacted in that way how would it be pleasing to God if I cut corners or if I 
uh, falsified paperwork or if I did something, if I, all of this. The same thing for those that were working on the sheep gate, that were working on the walls. How would it be for God if they did it halfway? How would it be for God if they did it so they would get glory from men? How would it be for God? So they were doing everything for him. So that's the way we need to look at this. When we look at the building of the, of the walls, the rebuilding of those and the gates, we need to look at them and understand what they're all for. Um, and so in these things that, that we're looking at, um, we can see that it was consecrated for the purpose of making sure that everyone knew the reason for building it up was for the service to God. That's what it was for. That's what everything was about. And so as they did all of this, the next to uh, Elisha, the men of Jericho built. It says that um, they built as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it. All of these rose up. They rose up with the brethren. All these guys came together with the priests and they started to build. And they built and they built and they consecrated everything as they were building it up. Um, next to him, the men of Jericho, they all got together. And next to them, Jakur, the son of Emery. And you see, they were coming together more and more and more people were beginning to come together. Like I said, um, there's, there's a lot of different names that we're going to see in here. Um, and in this particular passage alone, um, there's more than 50 names of people who came together to work on the wall and on the gates. So look at verses 3 through 5. It says, also the sons of uh, Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors and with its bolts and bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Erijah, the son of Koz, made repairs. Next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berchiah, the son of Mes let me say that again, Meshazebel uh, made repairs. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Bana, made repairs. Next to them, the Tekoites made repairs. But Look closely at this. Their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of their Lord. So we just read a whole passage and it was people after people after people after people that were working and doing. But the nobles of the uh, Tekoites did not work. They did not do it. So <clears throat> the fish gate got its name because of a nearby fish market. That's why it was a fish gate, because it was near the fish market. And, and the sons of uh, Hassanah did the work of rebuilding that gate with others. Um, and where it says made repairs, the word for repairs in Hebrew is uh, chazak. And it's used 35 times in this chapter alone. So um, the made repairs, that Hebrew word chazak was used 35 times just in this chapter. Um, it is the idea of strengthening or making something strong. So all these things that are happening, they're strengthening, they're trying to make it strong, all the things that they do. Um, in Ephesians, the Bible tells us that we are supposed to um, be built up and repaired. We're supposed to be built up and repaired. You know what that means? We're supposed to be made strong. How are we going to be made strong? If we're doing it all for God. If we're consecrating ourselves and we're giving him everything. If he's equipping us and doing all that. Now, when we look at all of this and we see about the Tekoites, they worked. They worked hard. They were from the city of Tekoa, and they were more than willing to work. But their nobles did not work. They did not work at all. Now, here's the thing. So what? The nobles didn't work, right? Well, guess what? Think about this. <laughs> the nobles did not work. And in all of the passage, everything that goes through there, it was made note of and put so that even today the people that study God's word can see that those people refused to do the will of God, that they stood back while everybody else did what they wanted to do. Think about that. They did that, and, and, and the, the word when it says um, that, they, the, that they didn't join in, the idea basically in Hebrew is they would not submit. It said they wouldn't bend their necks. The nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of the Lord. And, and the Hebrew, it talks about it, that they would not bend their necks. They would not submit. They would not do what God wanted them to do. So they did not submit. That's a problem. And when we think about that, think about this. There are people that say they, they love God. There are people that say they are believers. There are people that say they want to do what the will of God is, but yet they will not submit to what God is calling them to do. They won't submit. 
They say, oh, yes, I'm this, but they don't submit to what it truly is that God's calling them to do. And, and the reality is, listen, if, if you know that God's calling you to something, you're not submitting to what you know God is calling you to, then you're basically thumbing your nose at God, right? You're saying, no, I know better than you. I can do it my way. That's not how we need to be. We need to be submissive. That's part of who we are. If we're believers of God, we're supposed to be submissive. If he says we're supposed to scrub toilets, then we go scrub toilets, right? If he says that we're supposed to uh, stand in the pulpit and preach, then that's what we do. But we're supposed to be submissive to God in all that we do. And the, the nobles of these people would not do any of that. And basically, it was beneath them. Well, the high priest was out there working. How is it beneath these nobles to work? All of the people were working. So we need to think about that when, when God's people are coming together for something. In this whole passage, we're seeing group of people after group of people after group of people that are all coming together for one purpose. What is the purpose? To rebuild the walls and rebuild the gates. To make the city of Jerusalem God's glory again, like it was supposed to be in the first place. You know, we think about that, and, and as I think about all of that, I think about what's happening around our church right now. We're out there, we've got the, the parking lots being paved, we've got lights being repaired, we've got stuff being spruced up and looking good, all the things that are working on. And what is it for? It's not for uh, people to ride by and go, ooh, look, they, it's for people to see that it's for God's glory, that we care about God's house, that we're trying to make it look presentable because it is God's house. That's the whole thing, and that's, that's what's important. That's one of the things that's important about making sure that the church looks presentable is that when people ride by and they see things that are run down, that are falling apart, that aren't done, what they see is they don't even care about God's house. In this passage, we see the nobles did not even care about putting the, the gates and the fence and everything, the, the walls back together because it was beneath them. It didn't matter. But all these other people were coming together for the purpose of glorifying God through the rebuilding of his holy city. Look with me to chapters um, uh, 3, verse 6 through 12. So, moreover, Jehoiada, the son of uh, Peshaw, and uh, Meshulam, the son of Basodia, repaired the old gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. And next to them, uh, Meladiah, the Gibeonite, Jadon, the Moronithite, the men of Gibeon and Mizpah, repaired the residence of the governor of the region beyond the river. Next to him, uh, Uziel, the son of uh, Herahiah, the, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs. And next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, made repairs. And they fortified Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. And next to them, uh, Rephiah, the son of Hur, leader of the half-district of Jerusalem, made repairs. Next to them, Jedidiah, the son of uh, Harumpha, Harumoth made repairs in front of his house, and next to him, Hattush, the son of Hashabaniah, uh, made repairs. Uh, Malajai, the son of Haram, and Hashab, the son of uh, Patha, Moab, repaired another section as well as the tower of the ovens. And next to him was Shalom, the son of uh, Halahash, the leader of the half district of Jerusalem. He and his daughters made repairs. So, <coughs> All these names. Why is it important that we have all these names that Brother George can't pronounce? You know, why is it important that we have all these names in here that we're putting all this out? But look, they didn't just put their names. They put something else in this passage. What else did they put in this passage besides the names? They put their occupation. They put what they did. They put the things that they did in this passage. Why, why would that matter? Why does any of that matter? Well, sometimes, yeah, if they had the same name, and so that's a way of differentiating. But I, I, don't, I don't think that's really the purpose in this passage. I think the purpose in putting what their professions was was to emphasize the fact that they were not construction workers. They weren't professional builders. They had other professions, other trades. They were not professional builders, yet still they all came together and they built, even though they weren't the professional builders. 
They had a heart for God. They did. They wanted to bring glory on God. They wanted to follow what God told them to do. They were following the priest and the example that he set up. And everybody went out and built, even though they didn't know how to do it. They didn't necessarily know how to do some of those things, but they went out and built. Somebody would help them. You know, we have work days up here at the church sometimes, and we say, hey, you don't have to be, you know, whatever. You can come and be part of the work day, and, and come on up here. We got stuff to do. And you show up, and you say, well, I, you know, I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to plant things. I've never planted bushes before or flowers. I've never done that. Well, guess what? We'll show you how to do it if you come willing. If you show up and say, well, I don't really know how to, um, you know, put those boards up and do what, well, that's okay. Come on, we'll help you. We'll teach you. If you're just willing to come, we'll find a way for you to work. And oftentimes what you find out is you can do a lot more than you ever thought. People can do more than they ever thought when they're willing, when they're willing to do what they need to do. So the whole point is, <laughs> the whole point is the best ability that God wants is availability. The best ability that God wants is availability. That means that you be available for God and he'll use the abilities he gave you for whatever it is he wants. Okay? So he will do that. Now, the reality is all these people showed up. They all showed up to work. And by showing up to work, God used them. They fortified Jerusalem even though they were not um, brick layers. They were not construction workers they were not carpenters that we see they were perfumers uh, we saw some that were perfumers we saw some that were um had all kinds of different trades um and all the things that they had even though they were goldsmiths they were um all the different things that they had they showed up and god used them he used them no matter what and so that's an incredible thing for us to understand and i really like the the um commentator that I, that I was reading here I love the way he said the the number one ability we need is um, availability that's the number one ability we need for God is availability I'll be available God you use me whatever it is you use me whatever you want me to do I'm here and God you use me for whatever it is uh, I like the way that Isaiah replied uh, here am I send me he didn't ask, well, what's the mission? <laughs> How do I do it? Send me. Because if you send me, you'll equip me to make sure that it's done. We were talking about tonight that we might not have uh, some of the children's workers here. And what were we going to do, you know, if we didn't have somebody to go in with the children? And I said, God will provide. God's going to provide it. I don't know who, but God will provide. You know, so what an amazing thing. Um, <clears throat> here's something it, this uh, person, Vigio Olson, he helped rebuild 10,000 houses in war-ravaged Bangladesh in 1972. Um, and all of that that was going on, they asked why. They said they were uh, uh, received inspiration from reading the Bible where no expert builders were listed, yet they still were able to build. There were priests, there were goldsmiths, there were helpers, there were perfume makers, there were women, but all of them came together and they rebuilt the wall and they rebuilt the city and that inspired them to go and do what needed to be done because they were, they were inspired by that. Um, the broad wall, by the way, we talked about. The broad wall, today, today you can still see the remains of this broad wall in Jerusalem and it's more than 20 feet wide. Um, and, and here's a, another interesting thing I read when I was looking at all this. You guys, everybody understands that there are critics that say these things did not exist. That the, the, the passages of scripture that are written, all these things that are talked about, it's made up stories. It didn't exist, right? But guess what? Every time they talk about stuff like that, there are these people called archaeologists, and they keep finding the evidence that points to the fact that the scripture is true. The archaeologists keep finding these things, and archaeologists have found uh, many things that point directly to the walls and the gates and all of the things that they say never existed. When, uh, speaking of um, Joshua earlier, we're talking about crossing over into the promised land. Um, you know, when they crossed over into the promised land, the first place that they went to 
What was the name of the first place they went to? What? Jericho. When they went to Jericho, they marched around the city. They didn't hit it with cannons. They didn't rush it with uh, any, any kind of weapons. They didn't do any of that. They marched around the city. And when they marched around the city and, and shouted like God told them to, the walls fell down, right? But here's the amazing thing. The walls fell in. They didn't fall out. The walls fell in, allowing them to go right over the walls and into the city. They say Jericho never existed. It was a fictitious city. But when they excavated the area, which they say the Bible points to, to be the city of Jericho, you know what they found? They found walls that were had fallen in and was all burned. Everything was burned. Well, the last thing it says is burn it all up. After they took the city, don't leave anything alive and then burn up everything that's in there. And what did they find? Walls falling in and everything that had just been totally burned. But that city didn't exist. So we're seeing that even in things like this, the archaeologists, as they go and they excavate, they're finding things that absolutely prove what we already know that is true in Scripture. So it's an incredible thing for us to see this. Now, again, we see that in this we had the broad wall. We see the, the, uh, the leaders that were working. And uh, we see these leaders, even though they were leaders, they got right up there and they did what they need to. And it says, uh, uh, Jed Jedediah, the son of Haram Haramoth, made repairs in front of his house. Now, here's the thing. There's five times within the chapter 3 of Nehemiah where it says that those who worked on the section right in front of their house. And the reality is they started at their house and worked out. They began making the repairs right where they were, and then they began to go out from there. You know what I thought about when I read that is? How many times when we're trying to uh, make things better, do we start over there instead of right here? When we're wanting to make repairs and we're wanting to build things up and be strong, like we were talking about, the walls that they were doing, to be strong and to be made uh, strong for God, and we want to do that, here's what we want to do. Well, you know what? If we could just get old brother Hugh to do so-and-so, it would be much better instead of looking at, at George first, right? So if you look at George first and you start in your own home and then you work out from there, what if everybody did that? If we all looked inside ourselves first and that's where we started working, but God, start with me. Start with me and then once you get me right and you get me on fire, then I can start moving out from there. And if we're all doing that, then guess what? We're all going to start moving in the same direction. We're all going to start doing it. That's exactly what the people did when they were building the gate. They started with their home in front of their house. When they got it done, then they began to work towards their neighbor. Well, guess what? They met in the middle because they started on each other's house and then they worked towards their neighbor. They were meeting in the middle and they were getting this done in record time. They were getting all of this done in ways that it was amazing. And remember, they were laughed at when they said they were going to do this. You can't do that. There's no way you can do that, and yet they're doing it. How? In the glory of God, in the power of God, because they're willing to do it for God in the first place. Start in our own homes and let God work from there and then branch us out. That's exactly what they were doing. Um, so in 310, um, uh, Jed, and I say Jed, Jed, Jedediah, I don't know how it's pronounced there, um, his name means he who calls unto God. That's what his name means. Um, further on, we're going to see some other names. We're going to see Benjamin, which means the son of my right hand, speaking of a protector. Zadok, whose name means justice, uh, meaning that our homes are to be um, have justice and integrity. And then uh, Meshulam, the name means devoted. And our homes are supposed to be places of devotion to God. And then... Um, the son of Haram, this man is mentioned also in Ezra 10, and it was the man who was confronted by Ezra for the sin of taking a pagan wife. I think that he must have got right with God because now he's serving him, right? He got right with God and all of those things. So what we see in all of this is some amazing things as God uses it. Um, we see uh, Shalom, the son of Halahesh, he and his daughters made repairs, and so what we're seeing here is that everybody who could help did. Not only were the, the sons, but also the daughters. 
And so when we look at all of this, it's, it's everybody is on board trying to serve God in one mind, the mind of Christ, right? The mind of God. They, they didn't know Christ yet, but it is the mind of Christ. The mind of God all coming together to serve. That's what they're doing. They have that one purpose in mind. Look at verse 13. It says, Hanan, the inhabitants of Zanoah, repaired the valley gate. They built it, hung its doors with its bolts and its bars, and repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the refuse gate. Man, they just continued to work. They continued to do. They not only repaired the gate, but they did everything for it, and they continued to repair the wall. Verse 14, um, Malkajah, the son of uh, Rechab, leader of the district of uh, Beth Hakaram, repaired the refuse gate. He built it and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. So now they've come together. The first one went as far as the refuse gate. The next one picked up at the refuse gate and continued to work. And then uh, Shalon, the son of uh, Kal Hazah, the leader of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He built it, covered it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars, and repaired the wall of the pool of uh, Shelah by the king's garden as far as the stars that go down from the city of David. So in all of these things that we're looking at, all of these things that we're seeing, it's pretty incredible the way these things are happening. And all these people are beginning and they're going from one place to another and continuing on in all that they do. Now, if we, if we read on down through um, verse 25, what we're going to see is the same thing that all the way through. We're going to see that every person, they begin to rebuild. They begin to make the repairs. They begin to go from their place to the next. They make the repairs in the district. They do all of the things they need to do all the way down through verse 25. And by the way, where it talks about um, the king's garden, there were um, that's a, a beautiful picture because there were many of king's gardens that were there and so and all that they were doing there um it was it was incredible and so um i want you to look with me to um uh, um pick up and let's see um at the end i mean i'm sorry in verse uh, 26 verse 26 and 27 26 and 27 it says this moreover the nathenium who dwelt in ophel made repairs as far as the place in front of the water gate toward the east and on the projecting tower. After them, the Tekoites, wait a minute, we heard about them earlier. The Tekoites repaired another section next to the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. So as we look at this and we see again, um, all of those who continue to work and then the Tekoites, not only did they repair the other part, they weren't satisfied with that, they went on and started working somewhere else. But we still notice that it doesn't talk about the nobles of the Tekoites uh, doing anything even in this section still they were not uh, doing anything and so even the nobles who didn't work weren't going to keep those who were working from going after it they were continuing to build continuing to do all of those things all right so look with me to uh, 28 through 30 28 through 30 and 28 through 30 says beyond the horse gate the priest made repairs each in front of his own house after them, Zadok, the son of Emmer, made repairs uh, in front of his own house. And after him, uh, Shemaiah, the son of uh, Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, made repairs. And after him, Hananiah, the son of uh, Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zal Zalaf, repaired another section. And after him, Meshulam, the son of uh, Berecha, made repairs in front of his dwelling. So in all of these, they were making repairs in front of their dwellings, and they're continuing to go on, section after section. That's what they're doing. Now, uh, for um, um, Shemaiah, uh, uh, he was the keeper of the east gate. Now, apparently what we, what we find out about him is uh, the gate was in, in front of his house. The east gate was in good condition, so he pitched in and went over and helped out with the horse gate. Because it starts out there talking about the, them working on the horse gate. And then uh, Meshulam, he made repairs in front of his dwelling. And then it talks about dwelling, which uh, also found out that the word in Hebrew for dwelling uh, actually is chamber. And it refers to a singular room, meaning that his dwelling was just one single room. That's all that he had 
in the gate. But he made repairs to that and then continued to move on, working on everything that they were building. So all of these that are building, all of the things that they're doing, um, they are continuing to work on everything that, the, that needs to be done in order for the gate to be built. Now it continues going down and each one of them are continuing to make repairs and each one of them are joining in with another. They're working between one gate and another. They're working in front of their own homes and then they're moving on to something else. Some of them have worked in one place and they've moved on to work in another place. And so all of these things were continuing to uh, be done. Now, as, as we get to the very end here, I want to read um, the last two verses. After him... Uh, Mal Chajai of the goldsmiths made repairs as far as the house of the Athenium and of the merchants in front of uh, Mifkod gate as far as the upper room at the corner. And between the upper room at the corner as far as the sheep gate, the goldsmith and the merchants made repairs. Now, um, a couple of things I'm going to tell you about, but I want you to uh, uh, notice that um, the first one of chapter four, Sanballat gets pretty upset about all this that's going on. And we're going to talk about that next time. Um, but in all of this, some observations that I want us to make sure we understand. It pleased God for his people to be working together. They work together. That's a wonderful thing when we look at this passage is God was pleased with the people working together. That's why the progress continued so quickly because the people worked together and they were trying to repair the glory of God and the service of God. And so in all this, the people were working together. So it pleases God when his people work together. Some have to learn how to lead. Some have to learn how to follow. But all of them need to be together in one heart and mind. So when they come together and they do that, look what they could accomplish. Listen, this was not an easy task and it wasn't something that they had all of the skilled workers to do. But yet they were still continuing to do it. Um, also, this wall was continuous, by the way. There were no gaps in this wall. Any gap that was in the wall um, was being repaired. All the gaps were being repaired all the way around because any gap made that a compromised area of the wall. So there were to be no gaps in the wall. They couldn't just repair the gates and go, well, there's a few gaps here and there, but it'll be all right. No, they all had to be repaired because without it, it made the, the gate compromised. Um, the work that was done is a reflection of all of those that was mentioned and the leaders that were leading them. And all of this was an evidence of Nehemiah's leadership because he's the one that came there from the very beginning and he didn't have the qualifications for rebuilding the wall. He didn't have the qualifications as a priest to lead the people. He didn't have the qualifications to know how all this was going to do. But what he did have was the availability to give himself to God and to follow him out of um, captivity or out of Babylon, I'm sorry, and all the way back to Jerusalem where he was not had not been to lead the people because his heart was torn over the condition of God's kingdom. And so he took that action and even though he didn't know how to do all of that stuff, he still was able to do it. He was still able to um, lead the people and he was still able to do all those things you know probably one of the biggest in inhibitors for people serving God is the excuse I don't know how I don't know I'm not equipped for that I don't know how to do that well listen to me the perfumers did not know how to how to do construction they did perfuming the goldsmiths they did gold they didn't do construction uh, all of these people that did the blacksmiths, they did the stuff in the blacksmith shop, but they didn't go out and build houses and build gates and build uh, walls, but they all came together and God used every single one of them because they were willing. Because they were willing. The number one thing is, are you available? Are you available to God? If you make yourself available to God, you're willing to be used by God. Listen to me, he's going to use you and probably in ways that you never ever expected you know we could probably go around the room I know some of you I've talked to you in testimonies was God used you in ways you never expected nor wanted to be used Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh he did not he ran from God he didn't even make himself available but when he finally submitted and said okay I'll do what you want and God sent him to Nineveh what happened God used him 
not in ways he wanted to be used because he didn't want the people of Nineveh to get saved. He wanted the people of Nineveh to perish. But he went in and everybody in Nineveh got saved. God used him, even though it wasn't what he wanted. God used him in ways he didn't expect. God uses us. God uses us. The first time that I ever taught a Sunday school class, someone came and asked me to teach a children's Sunday school class. Teach fifth uh, at that time, I was supposed to be teaching fifth graders. And there was another class that was teaching sixth graders, boys and girls, in each of those classes. Very quickly after I, I went and, and started in that class, I realized this isn't working well. So I got together. There was a lady that was teaching the sixth grade, and, and myself and another man was teaching the fifth grade. And I said, listen, why don't we do this? I said, I'm willing to teach. I don't know. I've never done this, but I'm willing to do it. But I think we got to do something here. I said, why don't we move the fifth and sixth grade girls and put them in your class and move the fifth and sixth grade boys and put them in this class and let's keep them separated because in a couple of years, they're going up to the youth and they're going to be mixed up then. They're going to have enough time to be looking at one another at that point because they're just at the age where they're interested and they're more interested in whether Susie likes the way my hair is today than to learn the story about Daniel. And so we need to try to, so we did that. But God put me in that class. And I, like I said, I, I, I had never taught children. I didn't want to teach children, but I was asked if I could do it. The reason they asked me, by the way, is because uh, I was an army guy. And so I could walk up in the class and the boys would behave. That's what they really wanted was somebody that would make the boys behave. Uh, that was the whole point, but it turned into much more than that. God used it. I, I became available. He used it. I learned a whole lot, not only about myself, about the children, about being used by God. I used a lot of things. I learned a lot of things. And, you know, I didn't want to do that, but I did. And, you know, God continued to do that in my life. Uh, you'd think I would learn, you know, but even when he called me to be a pastor, I said, no, I don't want to do that. But, you know, anyway, yes. That's right. And that's what I think he did here. Well, he does that with a whole lot of people. The, the real reality is the best ability for you to use for God is your availability. Amen? All right. So um, we will be moving into chapter 4 of Nehemiah. Let's see. Next week is business meeting, isn't it? Okay. So we'll, we'll scratch the surface of it next week. Um, but then we'll finish it the week after that, but we'll be moving into chapter four and we want to see how happy Sanballat is about all this building that's going on. Okay. For those of you who have joined us online tonight, thank you so much for joining in. I hope that you were able to hear. I hope that we were able to get that where you could hear and uh, look forward to uh, joining back together again with you next week. We will do um, Bible study first and we'll do business meeting second. So join us at our regular time of 7.30. 6.30, and um, join us at 6.30, and then we will um, proceed from there. So thank you for joining in. God bless, and good night.